We'd like to welcome everybody to our Cafe Europa. Our panelists have already gotten started with their discussion um, <laughs> for today, which uh, is about uh, life, lifestyles, life, work balance, and how it uh, varies within Europe, how that uh, the approach to work-life balance is different in Europe um, than in the United States. We are very grateful to our panelists for being here. There's Professor Julie Allen from the Comparative Arts and Letters, um, <laughs> Professor Simon Greathead from the Business Department, and Professor Carter Charles from the Religion Department. Um, they have different experiences uh, living and, and working in different parts of Europe. So hopefully we will get to um, essentially just watch them have an engaging conversation. That's why we have the cafe set up. That's the idea behind these, uh, these talks, the Cafe Europas. Um, and we're so pleased that you were able to come. We know this is a crazy busy time in the semester. Um, and we will go ahead and start with an opening prayer, which uh, Rebecca Lines will offer for us. And then we will turn the time over to our panel to have their fun cafe discussion that we will all eavesdrop on. And then we'll, we'll have them finish up probably about 4.35 and then have time for questions. Thanks. Our dear Father in heaven, we're grateful that we're able to gather here together at this point in the semester. We're grateful for our panelists who have taken the time to come and speak with us. And we pray that as they discuss these things that we will be inspired of how we can uh, maybe improve these things in our own life, that we will have admiration for our brothers and sisters across the world. Um, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Uh, religious setting, you would not begin with a prayer, right? right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've never been in a cafe in Europe without a prayer, but, you know. <laughs> yes, but I, I don't have a problem with the prayer. <laughs> um, As a religion press, we have to say that. Right. Maybe we can give some background, right? Yeah, so, could do. Yeah. So, uh, Break the fourth wall, is that okay? I'm, uh, so I, I, I was born and raised in, in England, um, born in the city of Lancaster, and raised in a small village settled by Vikings in Yay, Vikings. Uh, around uh, the sixth century. Um, interestingly, I served an LDS mission here in Utah. That's what exposed me to Utah. Otherwise, I'd probably not not be here. And you managed to keep your accent. Well, <laughs> water. <laughs> um, Did you say it's a real, real, real thing? Yeah, uh, yeah. To a Perrier, right? Aren't we? <laughs> From Chicago. Um, yeah, and so, so that's sort of a bit of my background, and then uh, came came to the U.S. on a mission, and then went back to England to university. Whereabouts? Uh, in Preston, University of Central mm -hmm. Lancashire, just north of Manchester, and uh, and then finished at BYU. So I finished my undergrad here, but then uh, went back to England for several years to work, and so I think that's why I'm here on the panel. That's why I, I spent my childhood there. <laughs> And then most of my early working career was spent there. Okay. Yeah. Were you in, in the north still, or did you go down to London? No, I spent about 50% of my time in Ireland. Northern about, or Republic? Um, in the Republic of Ireland mainly, sometimes in the north, but mainly around Dublin. And then I spent about 25% of my time uh, in the Netherlands, in and around Amsterdam, and then about 25% of my time in London. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. I've only lived in England once, really. Well, twice. On study abroad, it doesn't really count, but um, six months in 20, 26, 2013 with four kids. Um, oh. The best part was buying the people carry out of Voxels of Fira. And, you know, minivans in Europe are smaller anyway, and so we packed all of our children in there. And then the left hand stick shift, we lived in Hemel Hempstead, mm -hmm. and then we have to drive the kids to, to their primary school and you have to drop them off and stand and wait until they took, went into their classes. And it, there's this roundabout in Hemel that's called the Plow. And it's a roundabout made up of roundabouts. So there's six roundabouts around the roundabout. And you're sh sh stick shifting yeah. with your left hand around the six roundabouts to get out of the roundabout to get your kids to school <laughs> on time. <laughs> and I think that, that's the greatest achievement as a parent, really, was that yeah. none of us ever died. With a quiche in the other hand. <laughs> right, or right. a Cornish pasty. Right, right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But most 
otherwise I've lived in, in Germany and, uh, and Denmark, um, in, speaking in terms of yeah, living in Europe. So we just lived in Germany from 2019 to 2020. We we're in, in Langen, south of Frankfurt, and made my kids go to German schools because I'm a particularly cruel parent. I wanted them to have really good college application essays <laughs> <laughs> about the trauma of going to school in a language you don't speak. It worked great. Cool. Well, I um, originally uh, from Haiti, and I lived for uh, 17 years. Um, well, more than 17 years. 17 years in mainland France, and then uh, about four years in French Guiana, which is French French territory, but uh, in South America. But I would say that um, living in main in Europe, you know, European France, I became very much like the French people. We don't travel around a lot. When we get settled in one area, we kind of stay, stay there and almost die there until <laughs> you get a job at BYU or Except something Except for going like on a holiday. <laughs> yes, yes. Four solid weeks yeah, every summer. Yeah, like we, we still have the house there, but like we will, you know, escape every now and then to, to enjoy the good life and good space and good time. But uh, yeah, for, so for 17 years I lived in Bordeaux or around Bordeaux in the southwestern part of France. Yeah. It's not interesting that Europeans aren't very transient unless they're on vacation. Right. And then right. they're very transient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very transient. Yeah. It's yeah. True. European yeah. vacations, I have to say. I mean, Denmark shuts down for the month of Ju July. Mm -hmm. Everyone goes to the summer house. My Danish colleagues there, um, email just says, I'm on holiday. I'll be back in six weeks. <laughs> and then the Americans say, I'm in, s I'm in surgery. I'll get your email in five minutes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That is my, so my true. On <laughs> myself. <laughs> that is so true. You know, you know, this actually takes us right into the subject. Just yesterday uh, on campus, I was looking at the student, and I get to see so many colleagues. Like, you know, they just came out of surgery, and they're still at work. Mm. Uh, in, in in most of Europe and in France, for sure, you will be, uh, you know. Um, uh, you, you'll have a medical note that says that you're not going to work for something like, you yeah. know, until you're fully healed or something like that. Right. And uh, that's partly just legal, right? I mean, I have a colleague who was here at BYU and was deathly ill and, and took a couple weeks off. And then they said, well, if you don't start teaching again, we're going to have to, like, you know, fire you. And so, it's okay. So the students came to his hospital room for yeah. classes, um, wow. which, you know, is a little extreme, but devotion. But it's true with, with parental leave, too. I mean, I have had four children in the U.S. and have gotten a grand combined total of zero days paid leave for those children, which my Scandinavian colleagues find, like, why do you live in a third world country? Why would you, <laughs> why would you choose to live in a place that doesn't value children or yeah. women or bodies? And uh, they take their 12 to 16 months paid leave. Um, and uh, I got a student evaluation that said, Professor Allen is so de dedicated that she came to class right up to her due date. And I was like, no, honey, I came to class five days past my due date, not because I'm dedicated, because I'm American <laughs> and <laughs> I don't have paid parental leave. I isn't, is, is it that way uh, in England, or you've also lived in Ireland? Uh, is it b yeah, yeah it, it's similar. Uh, um, you start with 21 days vacation, <laughs> and you have, what, four months, I think, is it four months uh, parental leave, and I think it's six months maternity leave. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's similar. And, and that, that's one of the great travesties, I think, of, of America, that it's a young country in more than one way, mm -hmm. that it hasn't developed its, its working policies and procedures ar around supporting the, the family like, yeah. like Europe has. Yeah, and it's, it's such a paradox at the same time, right? Because um, whether it's within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or outside, there is a general consensus that family matters, right? Uh, Only if you can afford it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, th there's this second part of it that's not always worded. You should be able to, to afford the, the family uh, financially and therefore uh, maybe work two or three jobs and not be able to, to enjoy the good life. I, I remember when I was a student at the University of Oklahoma, I did travel a little bit actually, but just for one semester. <laughs> um, I met this uh, French professor uh, who, American French professor who quipped um, <coughs> yeah, let's see if I can remember what he said. He, he in essence, said that um, in, in, in the American uh, culture, there is the sense that God cursed human beings with work, 
And in the French culture, there is the sense that man is not going to work his whole life. So he's going to, life is going to be more than just work. Mm. Um, and and, and I sometimes, uh, I, being a, a bit of a workaholic myself, I sometimes wonder where I actually uh, situate uh, sure. <laughs> in that. Um, that yeah. being said, I, I, I think it's pretty obvious for most people that if you're uh, in Europe, there is a sense that, okay, you're not going to be making a lot of money, but then life is not only uh, about money. Since we were going to talk about work and a couple of things that I knew would uh, come to the table, I, I thought I'd bring um, my, well, we call it a social security card. I thought I'd bring that and kind of pass it around and maybe uh, <laughs> if there are questions. I don't want uh, to be Carter Charles. <laughs> <laughs> so this is th there's mine here and, and my wife's. Uh, it's um, it, it's basically, uh, well, th we don't call it a credit card, but it's pretty much a healthcare credit card yeah. uh, that has basically no limit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. When my daughter was born in Denmark, I had had my oldest child in Boston in grad school and I got I had good health insurance and I got all the bills from Blue Cross Blue Shield to tell me how much it cost for a completely normal pregnancy with no complications. It was $30,000. Um, and then I moved to Denmark and they just said, well, of course, we value children, so <laughs> we'll pay for this and we'll, we'll mm -hmm. take care of you. And you go to the doctor every week and the midwife every other appointment. Yeah. And it was so lovely. And we were on a Fulbright scholarship. And so we were, it was designed for one person and there were three and a half of us because I was pregnant with my second child. And um, at some point, my, one of my colleagues asked how we were making things work, and I said, well, it's kind of tight. You know, we were at the end of the month sometimes where I had like a dollar. I'm not sure we buy milk for the baby or buy bread, right? And he said, well, that's not okay. We don't, we don't let people be that poor. Right, right. And so they started paying our rent. The state did. Right. And they started paying my son's child care mm -hmm. in addition to paying for my baby. And I just thought, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> 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 and I will pay this back gladly. And so I think that's one of the things that, like, yeah, my European friends, they pay more in taxes, but they get the benefit directly Right. And they see that when they need it, um, and so their houses are smaller and their cars are smaller. In Denmark, you pay 150% tax on a car, so they bike and they're super fit. And I'm like, well, I guess there's trade-offs, right? <laughs> it's also really <laughs> flat. But um, when we were in Germany, we didn't get a car because we just wanted to see what it would be like to live without it. And it was awesome. I got really good at balancing two grocery bags, one each on each handlebar, and then one in my backpack, and then one in my thing. I mm. could get like a whole week's groceries on my bike. Um, and my son loved being able to just bike to the store by himself and the autonomy my kids had. It was a completely different kind of life, and so I didn't have a fancy car, and I was living in an apartment, but it was um, really somehow easier in some ways. I, I guess distances also factor into whether you bike it or not. Well, I, I would ride the train when it was longer. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, America is a big country, right? It's spread out, and yeah. so we find that systems in in the east are different than out here. Mm -hmm. So our experience, one of my best experiences in Europe, was where we took a three-week. Uh, driving trip through Europe. Mm -hmm. So we left from England, got in a boat from Dover to Calais, and then we drove through Paris and up through the Alps, Switzerland, into northern Italy. And we spent 21 days, and it was just marvelous. Didn't even worry about work. And no, s no, no, I mean, I had cell phone, but no need to check it or <laughs> anything. Yeah. People <laughs> taking care of work. So I, I really do like this idea. I, I think generally in Europe, there's less of the, oh, I wish I'd done this with my family, right? There's mm. less of that. I think people yeah. generally do take those opportunities. Yeah. And talking about health, uh, my wife and I, we struggled to have children when I was finishing here at BYU. And uh, we went to do IVF. You probably heard about in vitro. It was $35,000 back then in the 1800s when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 35,000, that, that was more than my annu annual salary at the right. time. And, uh, and, then we were, and then I went back to England for work. Right. And we were in Manchester, that's where the head office was. And uh, St. Mary's, which is part of the University of Manchester, they pioneered IVF in 1979. Okay. And they had like an 86% success rate. And, and of course, when we went for the bill, it was zero dollars. Yeah. You do pay higher taxes, well but, yeah. but it's a trade off, right? And, right. and, and boy, my <laughs> wife and I are so grateful today for that opportunity to have landed mm. at a place that did IVF for free. And three of our four children are IVF yeah. babies. And so, um, and then of course, we were in a ward where the bishop died of cancer because he was on a waiting list. In England or in here? Eng in England. Okay, because yeah. And, the and that, side, would, yeah. that wouldn't happen here. So, so there is a flip side to yeah. it. Yeah. But, but I think understanding the benefits of both 
and the drawbacks of both is really important. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think also for mental health. I mean, like we often we workaholics prioritize earning the money, climbing the ladder, having all these these you know, big houses and big cars, and then we can, we can't. We have no space for ourselves, and yeah. so you know my, my European friends when they take their <coughs> month off and they go sit in their summer house and just yeah relax, yeah. turn off the cell phone. I just think that's there's something really good about that for your soul, for your family. Yeah, yeah my general sense is that there is something of a discomfort whenever people find that they have to take time off for themselves and for family. Mm. Um, they they start thinking that they're not normally constituted uh, beings. Um, and, and so whenever they hear, oh, well, yeah, anywhere you work in Europe, you, you're going to have these paid leaves, you're going to have this and that. Now, th there is ob obviously a, a flip side, financial flip side to it. But then, again, there is the sense that as a person, your existence cannot be reduced uh, to just work, work, yeah. work, and work. Well, and actually, we're not as productive <coughs> as we think we are here. I mean, we have the longest work week in the Western world, and our productivity doesn't reflect that. Denmark mm -hmm. dropped to a 35-hour work week, and their productivity is still better than ours. And so the l more you work doesn't mean the more you produce. And so you get burned out, and you mm -hmm. don't do your best work. And so right. I feel like sometimes we ought to take a hard look at what we are trying to accomplish. And if it is your productivity, um, and I think as professors, we know that, that when you have, when you have the freedom to set your own hours and work when you can do it, it's a lot more effective than punching a time clock. You know, they say, check in at eight, check out at five. I, I wouldn't write the books I write, because I write them at night, you know? On After your free time. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and so ultimately, it ultimately, it's in the best interest of your employer to kind of trust you that, that you'll do your work. Yeah, but yeah. I think that's really one of the key differences for me, uh, that the American system is based on mistrust. We don't trust each other. We don't trust our government. We were founded on mistrust. We left England because we didn't trust them. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a shame. <laughs> shame. <laughs> really sad. Um, and and <laughs> in, in, in Denmark, at least, they have some of the highest trust levels anywhere. And they've always trusted each other. And they went to their king in 1848 and said, this isn't working. We'd like a constitution. And he said, awesome. <laughs> let's write one. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. and, and it didn't happen overnight. It you know, took them 50 years to get that implemented properly to the actual majority rule. But, but this trust in your neighbor that, that we give them these benefits they'll use them and they'll, they need them and that I'm better off if my neighbor is better off. And so we talk a lot about how Europe is so secular and yet in some ways I feel like they, the people I know there live the gospel so much more naturally just because it's built in to, to care about your neighbor and, and take care of the poor. Right. And so we can you know, talk a lot about living the gospel. <coughs> we don't practice as well. I, I think, you know, um, I get to teach the gospel, right? Oh right, it's your job. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, I, uh, I often uh, find, you know, this, this sense of solidarity, of interconnectedness, and of caring for uh, one's neighbor that otherwise we would call Zion is something that is uh, embedded uh, culturally as you, you think about, okay, how do we make sure that there is some form of safety net for those who are least able in society and give them the opportunity to get on their feet and be able to contribute also along the way. Right. Yeah. So something we observed, especially among church members in Europe, was um, very much a family feeling and reliance and hanging out with one another outside of church. Mm. Yeah. And, and I sort of, when I first came back to the US, I thought to myself, boy, the gospel isn't lived as well here. <laughs> I, I've, si I've since come to sort of go through this the story of it's because many of the people in Europe are the only member within their family right. and so hence they, they gravitate to one another whereas here in Utah family and extended family are members of the church right. and mm. so therefore they'll when they're not at church they're with their family members right. it's just different it's just different yeah. but but I do agree with this safety net right this safety net that, that's been generated by many of the, the governments there to, to protect the most most vulnerable, right. whereas here we, we're still sort of wrestling with this ideology around, and, and I think it's a good wrestle, which is um, everybody can, can do something, right? And, and so we, we find this in England, there's just a lot of people in the welfare system that, that yeah. should not be on the welfare right. system, right. Right. More, but there's yeah. also a lot of people in England that are saved as a result of that. Right, mm -hmm. right. And, and so it's, it's that it's tension, isn't uh, it? Yeah, it's a question of, yeah, how, how do you uh, bring uh, balance to it? and what's your long-term long perspective? Yeah. Like, I um, 
I keep telling myself that I have been blessed as someone from uh, originally from a poor country. Um, I edu got educated in France, um, even got to study in the United States uh, for free, so to speak, right? But, you know, came out with a PhD and, and I'm not like in debt. And so that also gives me a more leeway to think about how I can also contribute. And in fact, I am still officially a, a, a civil servant in France. I am on leave, but the government can call me any time to kind of pay back my dues. And sure. um, if they call me, then I have to acknowledge that, hey, they paid for, for me to be where I'm at right yeah. now. So. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's been challenging. I mean, in, in Scandinavia and Germany, trying to extend the trust, extend the welfare net to new incomers. They've been really generous to take in refugees, and oftentimes those people can't function without the language, particularly, and so offering those kinds of benefits has, has then stretched the system really, really hard. And so trying to think of how, how to help people buy into the idea that this is, that we're all in this together. You know, mm. and I feel like that's something that we also do in the church. I mean, Utah has some of the lowest levels of income inequality in the country because we trust each other more, because we have the church to bind us and to help you know, foster our compassionate impulses. Maybe it's also why we have front runner, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's maybe a stretch, <laughs> but I, I, I love that we have that. It's, it's interesting. I remember the early 2000s when I first went back, back to the UK and we saw this huge influx of Eastern Europeans. Mm -hmm. and, and to many Britons, they were like, here they come taking our jobs and da da da. But, but what actually happened was, Eastern Europeans came in and they performed many of the jobs that the British were too lazy to do. Yeah. And, and today we have sort of second and third generation Eastern Europeans that, that I think many Britons are grateful for the role that they've played. Mm -hmm. So you have sort of these, these social uh, storylines which maybe aren't as true as these more underlying foundational principles yeah. that we need. We need immigrants yeah. and, and somehow we've got to figure out a way to bring them into our nation include them and, and so forth. But it is still a, a matter of helping them understand what things do matter. So when we lived yeah. in Germany, we were in this, uh, this apartment and we had um, Hungarians living above us, Turkish people across the, from them, us, so Americans, and then Germans across from them, Koreans down <coughs> below, and some um, Syrians below us. And I had this idea like it's going to be this great family, and it was actually really annoying <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> because, because various people in the apartment, I'm not going to say which ones, um, their kids left trash on the sidewalk and they didn't sort their trash. They didn't put their recycling in the right bins. And I found myself being like, there are rules. There are things yeah, to recycle right, in certain right, bins and right. you don't just get to throw your trash away wrong. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe they can do pictures instead of writing it in German, right? Maybe that'd be helpful and people would know. Because yeah, um, yeah. that's part of the social contract. It's like, right. you know, you can worship whatever God you want, but you recycle. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, you, you, you touch on something that's uh, also a reality. Uh, some of the tensions that uh, real, you know, that are real when you're dealing with different peoples and cultures and uh, you're trying to, to have that uh, social contract. It, it does require patience on the one hand, but it also uh, requires uh, education, yeah. educating uh, people to, 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 to be able to, to find a, a, a common ground. Because these people, they're coming from different ways of being. Yeah. Like it, I know that if I had moved, uh, you know, f straight from Haiti uh, to mainland France, um, it would have been tough for me and it would have been tough for my neighbors as well. Uh, because in Haiti, we like to, to have the music loud. And in some parts of France, that's okay. But in other parts of France, no, it, yeah. it's not okay. And how, how do we make it work so that ultimately everyone succeeds? Yeah, I think education is the key. I mean, seeing the way the schools are integrated. When we were living in Britain, my kids you know, had friends, although <laughs> my son's name is Soren, and there's the Charlie and Lola books in Britain, and mm -hmm. they have an imaginary friend named Soren, so some people's parents thought my child was imaginary, <laughs> 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 which was pretty fun. Um, but it was through the schools that they got, they made friends, and my, my little Soren started saying, Mom, can George pop round? Mom, can we have a muffin? <laughs> can we pop that in the bin, Mom? <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Um, but then in Germany, that's how they learned German, and like my daughter's best friend in Germany was a, a girl whose parents are from Pakistan, mm. who have immigrated. And, and I just thought those, that's how you make friends and you, you don't see any of the difference because you're, you just see like, oh, there's, these are fun people to hang out with. So Yeah, I, I found with, uh, I had probably about 60 Eastern Europeans that worked in my various warehouses in Ireland and the UK and Holland and they would come to work early. 
they would work extremely hard all day long mm. and they would stay at the end and make sure it was cleaned up. If I would interpret that, especially for my, my British and, and Irish workers, they'd arrive late if they arrived at all. When they came, they didn't work very hard. And then, so I'm just yeah. generalizing yeah. now. Yeah. So, so <coughs> I think for me, when I worked with my Eastern European friends, they brought many of the traditional values that I saw in Britain that w we'd lost, which is yeah. understanding when you're at work, you work and right. And, and the other thing I, I observed is one of, one of my workers, Peter from Slovakia, his mother passed away. And he was hesitant to even ask me for a couple of days off to go to his mother's funeral mm. because he didn't want to lose his job. He didn't want to lose his position in, in, in Great Britain. And I, and I just felt really bad that he didn't feel like he could ask me for some time off. And, yeah. and when I found out, I got, got him on his way there. So I, I agree what you're saying. This is sort of got to become part of society, but at the same time, <coughs> bring these valuable differences, yeah. right? Yeah, and lift society. The, the, the lift yeah. society, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, I think this speaks to, to something that I, um, I, I find myself, you know, wondering how between what I saw and experienced in France, it, which was sometimes on the extremes, but it, which also has its values, how I could see some of that being valuable uh, in the United States. For instance, I can think of why, you know, native Europeans would show up late at work or not at all, uh, there's unions, right? Mm -hmm. they, they are protected by uh, their, the unions. Um, unfortunately, this speaks to an extreme that is all too, too common, in fact, but reversely, your uh, employee, um, if he had known that y you have a right, you can, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. go and b take care of your family and you, you, you'll, you will not be fired. And sometimes I find myself thinking that, well, you know, here in many ways, it's you against a huge machinery with has all the resources and if necessary, the lawyers against the little vulnerable you that has to deal with it. And sometimes I, I wish that we'd had a middle ground here, just like I wish we'd mm -hmm. have a middle ground in, in Europe. I still, I still believe that we can make it happen. I feel like you know that what I find from having lived in Europe and, and having studied it is that there's so much good. It's kind of like President Hinckley in the gospel, right? Like you find the good things wherever they are, and you try to integrate them into your life. Right. And so, and then we bring also the good things. And so I, I always have loved that, that ability to be like, oh, you know, I can go and I can make Cornish pasties at home and watch Great British Baking Show and <laughs> be absolutely chuffed. Except in Paul chuffed. Hollywood, chuffed. Paul chuffed. Hollywood makes all the wrong decisions in the last season. I'm sorry, you can forever. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but so I think that's the, that's the best part. Like, I mean, I never yeah. felt like people didn't value me because I was American. Um, people always appreciated me trying and but but also because I was always interested to find out what I could learn from them. I didn't come and be like, well, in America, we do all the things right. You yeah, know, because, yeah. you know, we do some things well that and other things not as well. Th that's the great danger, right? I'm taking a group of study abroad students going to Paris first and then we'll go to London, spend three weeks in each. And I'm going to come with you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, number one, you must not compare, yeah. right? So when your mind will say, well, this is how we do it in America. Please don't go there. Say to yourself, wow, that's really interesting. Let me learn from it. What do I like about what I'm seeing? What do I not like? And keep it to yourself. Share yeah. what you like, what you don't like, keep to yourself. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Including the yeah. food. To, to avoid <laughs> cultural misunderstandings. <laughs> <laughs> British food, not French food. Uh, I'll like clarify food. that. Well, <laughs> I, I guess I guess if you, if you give them oysters, then they, they will let you know that they don't <laughs> like it. <laughs> but if you give them a, a Devon cream tea with a scone. Yeah, I that's think. right. Yeah, maybe, maybe yeah. Cornish pasty. Yeah. Well, that reminds me of a story. We were in Cornwall having a Cornish pasty. I was with my uh, my mother-in-law who come over from America. She was, uh, we're in St. Ives, believe it or not, St. Ives, little quaint town, big seagulls all around. She had a Cornish pasty, she was just about to eat it. <laughs> and, and it flew between her hair, over her head, and bit this big V-shape out of a Cornish pasty and <laughs> took off. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, they're well trained. Those, those Cornish yeah, they singles. are. Yeah. They are. And it wasn't a very good Cornish pasty anyway, yeah, well. so she didn't miss much. Yeah. <laughs> so, how long did you uh, live in Europe total, Julie? Oh, well, like between the age of fifteen and twenty-five, I lived in Europe longer than the U.S. I think I was like six years in Europe, four in the U.S., and then 
after I turned 25, got married, had kids, it was harder. So I'm, I'm trying to you know, work my way back up to parity, but <laughs> it's, it's tough. Also having a job here makes it hard. Um, I think all told, I've probably lived in Europe about, about, yeah, about eight years. So nowhere near your 17. But, um, but there are some things like the food that you get there that you just can't get here. And so whenever I go, I go shopping. It's, it's kind of pathetic. Like my suitcase is just all passion fruit curd for the National Trust mm. and uh, mm. Smarties for my mom and um, bread and cheese, pickled herring from Denmark, curried herring. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. I know it's probably illegal, mm. um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's sealed, right? It's not like I'm bringing biltong from South Africa or anything. Um, I, I can't even. I mean, the list of foods that I've brought back, I mean, I really, there's a netto by the airport in Copenhagen, and there's, I will often go and, like, I still have three pounds in my suitcase. Mm. I'm going to go and, like, just fill it full yeah. of Danish food. Um, the, the crispy dried onions, the rye bread. Um, I brought back strawberry juice, and elderberry juice is one of my favorites. It's really dark yeah. purple, though, mm. and I always worry my suitcase will break. And then if I, if I find my suitcase dripping purple, I'll know it's, it's happened, oh. but it hasn't yet, mm. knock on wood. Um, and so I feel like, you know, there's things, I love the things that you can't, that you can't get them here because it makes it so particular, that you yeah. go there and you get a thing that you can only get in this one place, um, you know, like Devon custard or something, or clotted cream, yeah. um, or French baguettes, which just don't taste the same anywhere else. Oh, no, no, never. So I'm just curious, if you, if you had to take one thing from the US to, to America, I know that that would please my wife. She is in love with the United States right now. Great. Um, uh, if I were to say we're going back to France, then I would have to take something American to France for her. So if you had to take one thing American to you, what would that be? Your suburban. I don't have She will bike it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I probably would. Just, you know, I, I, I joke that I went on my mission to Denmark and I got converted to Danishness. <laughs> like, and that was, probably wasn't the plan, but it definitely had the effect. Um, I mean, I think your, your hesitancy I'm tells me that your heart is in Europe. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think of tangible objects from the United States. It, Anything. It's hard. I would take the friendliness. Like the, w the thing I, I miss in Europe is hospitality. That people, people are so genuine once you get past the like 47 layers of crustiness, right? <laughs> 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 and it can be really hard to break in. And people have known each other since they were children. And in the US, you know, it may be only skin deep sometimes, yeah. but, but you know, the friendliness is, mm -hmm. is there. And so if we could combine that, like genuine friendliness when you first meet and genuine friendliness after you've met someone for a while, th I think that would, I would, that would be the mm -hmm. ideal world. That's, that's Zion for me. You know, uh, you, you t this is exactly one of the things that makes my wife loves uh, the United States and, and Utah. Um, she finds people here to be uh, very patient with her more so here than in France. Generally, people often, mm -hmm. even like, you know, in business, they, they look grumpy. And <laughs> it's like, what are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> Buying my coffee or something like that. That's a very good point. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's tricky because, like, I, I hate tipping. Like, I, I would so much prefer to pay 25% VAT on the things that I'm buying in a restaurant and know that the workers are getting paid decently. Perhaps you know, they if have we vacation tip them, they will smile and, more. And I hate that people are dependent on tips, and yet I know people who work in the service industries, and they get great tips, and they love getting tips. And so I'm yeah. like, well, how do we manage this? That I would rather just know that you're getting health care and vacation, and I don't have to worry about this. Um, and it's not dependent on whether or not you smile at me enough or are quick yeah. enough to refill my, my glass. But at the same time, <laughs> let people have room for generosity and, and the kind of spontaneity that you get. Um, in the best case. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing missing from Europe, right, is service. We, I mean, it's really difficult to get good service there. But then again, you say that in the, here in the US, I think Utah is an anomaly. Yeah. Right? Whenever I travel outside of Utah, <laughs> it's more like Europe, <laughs> right? The way that your, your, your service is Not provided. California, New York, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th those places, yeah. yeah. Well, and Boston. People are busy. Yeah. 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 True, yeah. true. Um, well, the reason I'm asking is, uh, well, I'm not, I'm not hoping to pack my suitcase and go back to, to France soon, but... Full of, um, like, frosted mini-wheats or... Uh <laughs> 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 no, it's just that um, it's... Because I, I, I lived for so long in Europe and in France and because of this uh, things that I got all acculturated into, uh, I, I think I am very uh, nostalgic, and we all are uh, at certain levels. But one of the things that's been a concern for me is, um, I mean, I have a good job here at BYU, but I am 
worried to death should anything uh, in terms of health uh, affects me or uh, a member of my family. I, I keep telling myself I am not making enough money to, to cover the bills because I, I see it's COVID aside, even before that, I see some of the bills people are getting, some of the bills that you mentioned, I'm like, whoa, I hope I don't have to sell my house and then go broke and yeah. still in debt. Mm -hmm. Now that precarity is real. I mean, I, I feel like in the privileged position I have with a good job and good salary that my, we have good insurance, you know, my life is as good here as it would be anywhere. Right. But it is this sense of precarity. Like when I had cancer uh, 10 years ago and I had just had my fourth child and I'm the breadwinner and I thought if I die and I have my husband with four kids and no income, like what options does he have? He goes and lives in his parents' basement, right? Like this, is, this isn't a sustainable system. And so it's, yeah. it's this sense always of I'm so blessed please let me stay blessed, right? <laughs> <laughs> because yes. there's no, there isn't much to catch me. Uh, and get life insurance, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah, but I think we're at almost at time, so maybe yeah. we should um, see whatever else right. thinks and, and wants to know more about, so. Questions? Yeah. So my parents lived in France for 20 years, and that's where <coughs> all five of my siblings and I were born. We were all IVF. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, what you think were, um, if any, the the, negative aspects of working in France or in Europe um, and what the upsides of working in the U.S. are? Well, the problem with, with France is it's just got too many French people in it. <laughs> Have you taken a look spoken at like, as as Spoken like a true Englishman, Russell, right? Um, so. I, 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 I like the discussion that we've had. I, I think for me, I really appreciated this, uh, this mental freeness from work. I really loved that. Um, I, I didn't worry about work as much in England. And, and I actually probably had more of a managerial role there than I did here as a professor, right? So I had more responsibility, but yet my relationship with my work role was more balanced, equitable, versus where I am today, which is answering an email five seconds after it comes in. The other thing I'd say is I absolutely love my interactions with the membership of the church over there. Um, just uh, that, that family, that camaraderie, it was, it was a real special time, I would say, in my wife and, and my life on this earth, was our time with the saints in Swinton, England. Yeah, those are the two things I, I come to my mind. I, I, I would say the same regarding church life and work life. Um, the, um, th there is a sense that you know, uh, Jesus said that um, man shall not live by bread alone or else where you have this idea that the Sabbath is made for man and not meant for that Sabbath. And if I were to paraphrase that French professor, professor I would say um, work was made for man and not meant for work. That's generally the, the way it is in France. And um, I, I, I tend to work hard. Uh, I am a bit a worker of a workaholic, but I just like the idea that there's always a quest to to find balance. You're going to have productivity. There's expectations, but people understand that if you're worn out, if you're burned out, I mean they can always hire someone else. But they also understand that if you take care of your employees if you make them work the place and if they have time for themselves and for their families, then they will come to work in a better mood and be more productive. But I think for me, the, um, the b advantages of working in the US is that we have so much more sort of imagination that uh, in a lot of my uh, colleagues in Europe, it's like what you've studied, like you decide early on, you know, even sometimes as early as third or fourth grade, what direction you're going. And that can be really hard to shift tracks. Like I know you can, like you can go to a trade school and then go back and get your high school degree and then go on to college. But then you have to pick your major before you ever start college and you get into your university based on your major. And so you're always having to make choices before you're ready to make them in some cases. And then when you have that degree, that's the degree you have. And so I have a degree in Germanic languages and literatures and I teach, you know, dragons and migration and silent film and you know whatever and and european colleagues are often like well how do you do that i'm like 
well, I can. Like, I, I'm competent, and people trust me, and they let me do it. Whereas there, it's often like, but that's, this is your job, and this is your, your, your qualification, and you can't leave that. And so the rigidity, I think, sometimes of the European system yeah. um, is frustrating, where the American system, it's maybe more precarious, but it's also like the Wild West. Like, you know, if you can make it happen, you can yeah. do it. And this is also one of the reasons why people don't move so much uh, in France. It's also tied to their jobs, and often they don't have the, the sense that they can, you know, start a new life, a new career. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is one of the drawbacks. Yeah. In England, several years ago, there was an article, it was either the Financial Times or, or the Times of London, and it said something along the lines of, why is it that America is so, um, they think about all the ideas, so innovative, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but yet, here in Britain, we're still doing a lot of the same things, you get in the track light yeah. that you talk about. And I think here you're taught, taught that you can dream big, right? Yeah. Here in America, you dream big. Yeah. E even if you don't have the ability, you can still dream big. Yeah. Whereas in Europe, I think from an early age, you sort of get, get in your track and, and you, you to be a certain way. And yeah. there are some pluses and minuses to that, right? Mm -hmm. so you get people early in their career doing what they love, but you also get people early in their career doing what they don't love, right? And they haven't figured out what life is. And mm -hmm. like for in, in England, for instance, you graduate high school and you're, you're 16. You go on if you want to do advanced level, A level, for two more years that sort of narrows your focus. And then by the time you're 18, you go straight into your business degree, or whatever degree that is, yeah. for three years. And, and, I, and I love that, because I think by the age of 18, you should know where you are. Whereas here in America, at the age of 18, you're just getting into school. And then you do two more years of whatever, right? I, and I, and I, so, I mean, I'm arguing here that I think in America, we need, we need to say, the age of 18, most people should have generally direction where they, where they want to go. And maybe high school should be a little more focused towards the end, right? Yeah. Get by the age of eighteen, start getting into what you want to do. So, yeah. Yeah, great Good. question. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, great. Other thoughts or reactions? Just yeah. Um, how did you find like race and like being a woman? How that works in the workplace here versus in Europe? I'll fix the woman part, you can fix the race part. <laughs> 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 we, can, we can trade that up. Well, <laughs> you, you, you experienced it a little bit in Europe. You mentioned the different peoples and different cultures you're interacted with that yeah. immigrated. And yeah, no, it's, it's definitely kind of a tricky yeah. time for Europe. I mean, trying to, trying to negotiate that and, and trying to, I mean, they don't have the same baggage that we have in this country, which gives them opportunities. They also don't have the hundreds of years of trying to work through the baggage, um, which gives us some advantages. Um, for women, though, I think they're, they're, they're kind of light years ahead. I mean, in terms of supporting women and gender equality and, and just, you know, the w division of labor and families is, is in Denmark, in the Scandinavian countries especially, is better. Germany is still trying to figure that out. Like, there's a lot of schools that don't have lunch, and so moms have to pick up their kids and serve them lunch at 12 and so how do you have a job you have two off hours off in the middle of the day mm -hmm. and here again if you have the resources you can have a really like I think it's it's been easy uh, well easy let's say it's been doable you know to, to raise my family and work and, and achieve my goals and and I have felt all throughout my career that the Lord was directing me to do the things I did but um, but it's also only worked because my husband has been really supportive and has been there for my kids because to pay full-time daycare for four children in this country would take another a third person like we should bring back polygamy that third person can just work <laughs> <laughs> and pay for the child care right because um it's um it's been tricky and so and i also it's hard to separate gender from church issues in this country Whereas in Europe, it's, it's clearer because like religion is so much out of the public sphere that it doesn't really impinge. And here, the perception of, of me as a woman and me as a Mormon woman or me as a working mom who's also a member of the church, those things get all, get all muddled together. And so I felt super blessed because like my dad <laughs> was very empowering and his mom was really empowering. And so I had sisters that were empowering. And so you know, we went to grad school together. My sister and I got PhDs together, but we were always the only ones. And I was like, well, I'm glad I have my sister <laughs> because I was, I'm like, people always get like, so what did your husband do? I'm like, he gardens, snowboards, plays bagpipes, um, you know, renovates the bathroom. He's also a linguist with a PhD, but you know, um, and it's just that sort of perception always that, that I wouldn't be as accomplished is, is maybe a little kind of annoying, but. Um, on the race part, I, um, 
When I lived in French Guiana, I saw different types of racism, blacks on blacks racism. In this case, it was informed by social status. Generally, the blacks in French Guiana, because they are French and um, they are more educated than Haitians, and they tended to uh, look down on Haitians. Um, when I moved to mainland France, I um, I was for, for six years in the secondary school system. Uh, I was in two different high schools and I had, I had never been one of three black faculty members. I taught for four years uh, in a university in Bordeaux. I was one of four tenured black faculty members. That being said, I, I can't say that I experienced uh, racism um, in professional settings. Um, actually here in religious education I am one of two faculty of color out of uh, 70 uh, something full-time faculty but or maybe less less faculty members but um, while I have not experienced racism always personally I have felt it and I have seen it and it intersects with several other factors. If you're a woman and if you're coming from a poor background, um, th th there is often a sense that, especially here uh, in the United States, because of the history, um, there is sometimes a sense that you're not deserving of your position or of where you are, which also triggers psychological concerns about whether you know you're, it's really true or not. Um, it's also I, I've also seen that the times of um, when when there is a lot of push and a lot of desires to 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 bring changes are also times of tensions, um, because some people don't understand the, the conversation that is uh, taking place and so whenever the question of race is brought there there are times when people want to brush it aside by placing an inappropriate label on it like CRT. CRT is sometimes a way to dismiss all conversations about race but I would say that the, the people who understand who they are and what they are about or the kind of people who will go through these things, they will not be unscathed. They will be hurt, they will be pained, but they will muster the courage to go through these things and bring about changes ultimately. Catherine. Um, going back to this idea of nostalgia and, and also not comparing country like America to Europe, with each of your time in Europe, what do you feel like you took with you um, to America that has either blessed you or um, or helped you be unique? So uh, it's interesting. I whenever I go back to England, there's something I always appreciate, and it's the reality of people. Here in America, we always tend to have our our best self on show, right? Whereas the English recognize very quickly that that's just not reality. And so I just find that my just general conversations with people are more genuine, generally speaking. That's not across the board. It's just an observation that, that the British, especially if there's a relationship there, it's extremely familial and easy. Whereas, I don't know. It's just a little more difficult to get to that point here in America where we've always got our Facebook face on, right? Um, that's what I appreciate. Yeah. I think for me, it's um, autonomy. That it's our society. We're so we're trying to protect everybody so much all the time. We're protecting our kids and and driving them to school and walking them to school and taking care of them. Every I went to Germany when I was fifteen and 
like discover that I could get on a train, I could go anywhere, and yeah, sometimes I got stuck and had to eat chocolate <laughs> from a vending machine, but you know, it was okay. <laughs> and so just this belief that I could, I could do anything. I mean, I, I went to Germany as a pretty shy middle child and came back with this like sense I was Wonder Woman, right? I could, I could yeah. do anything. And so tried, trying to give it to my kids when they went over there, just like, you can get on a bike and you can go there, you can get on a train, you can go there. And, and I think that has been really, really beneficial for me, and partly because it is possible with the infrastructure and the proximity and you know, the, just the general safeness. Um, but, uh, yeah. I, I don't know how to satisfactorily uh, answer this question because I, I am a very much a universalist who believes that we are all unique. We all bring something somehow to, to the table. Um, in, in my case, if I do bring something, it's the fact that I was trained in France and studied religion and history in the United States. So I had a European rigor and European perspective on, uh, on things. Um, my training was very much pluridisciplinary. Um, while I, I sometimes say that I am a socio-historian. That is terminology that we use pretty much, pretty uh, often in France. And to say that um, I if you're trained in history, you're doing something that, especially history of religion, that intersects with uh, sociology, especially if you're looking at contemporary religion and religious life, for instance. But my training also uh, included linguistics. Um, um, and, and I got that training in different parts of France, not only mainland France for the university part, but I lived in French Guiana, like I said. Um, so uh, I, I would say I bring to the table something that makes me um, unique, but there is a lot of uniqueness, lots of uniquenesses. Uh, that's my universalist perspective on it. Yeah. We're going to have to call it a day, but we appreciate you for coming, and we appreciate um, the insight that you've shared with us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.